I'm going to ask you a topical thing first. Mm. A, lot, a lot of what I want to ask you is about the past and where your politics comes from. But I want to ask you, first of all, and I'm going to do this uh, slightly to help people in the room, because I'm guessing that not, not many of you take the mail on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, that, that was bang on. Okay. Um, it's the right answer. <laughs> uh, but Chuck is in there uh, today, and uh, he's given an interview, and there's a massive controversy about where your suits come from. Um, is it, th this is the big debate that the, the, the country is gripped by. Um, can, can you help us? Are they made to measure Savile Row suits about the price of a house in Salford, or are they something slightly, uh, something slightly cheaper? Nice, easy question for Mark Payne. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I should just pack up and go home, really. Um, <laughs> Uh, my um, organiser, who is one of my dearest and oldest friends, who uh, ran my selection campaign and also ran my election campaign, his sister, um, comes from a good Labour family, um, started up a small business making suits. She used to work at one of the major, um, major tailors, if you like, in London. And so I, I wanted to help her. I got my suits from her when she started up three or four years ago, and I still get them from her now. And she's brilliant, by the way. <laughs> Um, so that's where I've got my deal. Would she give us all a discount, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know, but do go and, and visit her site. She's an up-and-coming... And the name is? Alexandra Wood. She's brilliant. Okay. She's brilliant. Um, well, we haven't really cleared, cleared up the price matter, but... Uh, they <laughs> it was less than £500 before okay, you asked, yeah. Do. Considerably. Now they're interested. <laughs> <laughs> um... And uh, bef before we go into your past as well, I'm just going to—I was just looking to um, check where I should be uh, mm. now, <laughs> and uh, I noticed where you are um, at six o'clock tonight, and um, you're in two places, <laughs> according to this. Anyway. Oh, am I? Where does it it's say I really, am? <laughs> uh, um, but but it's interesting the two different places that you're supposed to be in, because yeah. um, according to this guy, not the Bible, perhaps you, um, you're at the Compass Rally and you're at the Progress Rally. I am. You're at both. Not at exactly the same time. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I, I think I'm doing compass first and then I'm doing progress. And some people uh, might think that's akin to doing the political splits. And they think I'm a bit of a tart or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are those two groups compatible? They're entirely compatible because, look, we are a broad church in this party. And I'm really proud that we have a range of opinion from... Jeremy Corbyn to Peter Mandelson that sits in the Labour Party. We get our strength from that. And uh, Progress and Compass do slightly come at centre-left politics from a slightly different angle. But essentially, the majority of people who are involved in each of those organisations want to see the same thing. And that is a social democratic centre-left government, which is essentially what we are, a Labour Party. So. That's why I'm quite happy to be on both platforms. And in, in many respects, actually, um, Gary, if you look at some of the thinking that has gone on uh, around what we stand for, our, our ideology, our principles, and how you apply those social democratic values in a modern setting, it was a coming together of people who, you know, I suppose uh, in recent times have very much been associated with each of those uh, organisations from John Cruddus coming from I suppose the Compass angle to Jim James Purnell coming in from the Progress angle which uh, produced and worked around the ideas which have been badged Blue Labour. Now I don't particularly like the Blue Labour badge but I think that is really interesting and we need to do the intellectual heavy lifting. I think one of the problems the government has run into trouble isn't just that they're incompetent and that they're heartless and hopeless <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it is that they drew the wrong lessons in some respects from uh, the group of people who helped found New Labour and get us into office in 97. They saw that as essentially quite a superficial exercise, which was about us kind of rebranding and showing we were at ease with certain things, when actually what Tony Gordon and everyone else did in the lead up to 97 was some heavy intellectual lifting about who we are, what we believe in, and how we applied that in terms of policy in 97, they didn't do the same. 
And so very quickly it has fallen apart because aside from deficit reduction, there is nothing to anchor them at all. That's why, you know, when people ask the Prime Minister, or asked him before he became Prime Minister, why would you like to be Prime Minister? It's kind of telling his answer was, well, I think I'd kind of be good at it. Um, there was nothing beyond that. No, that's not quite his um, um, accent. Can, can we, can we, can, talking of accents and backgrounds and that sort of thing, though, can we can we talk a bit about where you come from? Yeah. Um, it, tell us about your parents and, and and how they come to meet where your where your fathers uh, come from. Well, in many many respects, and um, I suppose I'm a uh, the way I describe it is I'm a kind of I'm a product of what London has become, uh, which is a multicultural, vibrant, energetic, and fantastic city. And um, I'm immensely proud uh, to be from London, but I'm a, you know, I'm a Nigerian, English, and Irish extraction. And there aren't many people who can say that, I suppose. And in that sense, I'm a, I'm a product of London. But it certainly has shaped um, my, my family is, I suppose, unusual in some respects, um, but it shaped who I am and it sh it's definitely shaped my politics. And growing up in Streatham has hugely shaped my politics too. But, uh, people may not know, I mean, your, your, your father comes over um, in, in what circumstances? How does he actually come to meet uh, your mother? Because she's from a, a, a quite a different sort of background. Yeah, well, so my father arrived in uh, Liverpool at the docks in the mid 1960s and had no money, had nothing. Actually, somebody lent him the fare to get down to London where he was gonna take up lodgings with um, friends and uh, worked his way up. It was a complete self-made man, um, washing cars, washing plates in restaurants and doing evening lessons, getting his kind of business qualifications. And then in the end, set up an import-export business, importing and exporting goods from a range of West African countries in Europe. Um, and uh, unfortunately, sadly, we lost my father, but I, I mean, his is an amazing story which continues to inspire me. And one thing I, I often say, I mean, he, I mean, some might think that if you look at his background, the kind of self-made man entrepreneur, he would be, some would argue, naturally inclined to the Conservative Party. But my father absolutely worshipped Harold Wilson. He thought he was absolutely fantastic and brilliant and worshipped the Labour Party and what it achieved for people like him. Um, so that was my father's background and, and my mother's was very different and one of the things that I find I'm always slightly bemused by because of my ethnicity people make certain presumptions about my background and they will talk to me as if I've had a very very tough background I've grown up on say one of the estates in my constituency and I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all but I'm not into kind of promoting a, an image or being a fake and pretending to be something that I'm not and I, I, don't, I my, you know I am the grand my, my, my grandfather was a high court judge and a prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials so in that sense it's quite unusual because I, I don't know people uh, I think find it hard to pigeonhole me in a sense um, uh, but my, my parents met, um, they met in, in, Lo in London at a party. I think, I can't believe I'm telling everybody this. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> soon after, in the late 70s, under a Labour government, I was born. <laughs> and um, school doesn't quite work out for you when you're really young. It's not going too well. So they decided to send you to a private school yeah. with your parents. Yeah. Um, tell, tell me about that and what the well, I went, what I was going wrong, what changed? I went to... Um, uh, a state primary until just before the 11 plus and I think I mean it was at a time in Lambeth frankly when the education system was in particular failing black boys and I didn't subsequently learn this to I was somewhat older my parents didn't tell me at the time but at the time they had been told and I think certainly felt I was being stereotyped that I mean, I was a late starter, so I didn't really excel academically to later on um, at secondary school. And they were told when I was eight by one of my teachers that um, he's going to really struggle GC you know, with his GCSEs and um, don't know whether you want to subject him to A-levels and, and Mrs. Amuna, university really isn't an option. And they were telling my parents this at the age of eight, and that is what... Uh, precipitated me, them, them taking me out of the school that I was in and, and putting me into the 
to the independent day school that I went to in, in South East London. And that actually, I mean, I discovered that um, towards the end of my secondary uh, school schooling. I, w I, I went to sixth form at my school as well. And that, uh, along with growing up in Lambeth, uh, visits to Nigeria, which I can, I'm happy to expand on. But when I discovered that, I th it, it definitely had a massive impact on my politics because I felt if they couldn't have afforded to take me out of that situation, uh, you know, at that point I think I'd secured a place to study English law and French law at Manchester University, it wasn't lost on me that I probably wouldn't be in that position. Um, and, you know, that, that, that is one of the reasons, obviously, why we have to actually transform our schools and ensure that everybody has that, is given that platform to succeed regardless of your personal background or circumstances. And, 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 and this is one of the reasons why I've said, ultimately, what I would like is for the private education system in this country to be completely redundant. It's, um, you mentioned uh, going back to Nigeria um, on, on trips. I'm interested to hear what you uh, were making of it as a, as a, as a young child then. But uh, it's when your father is in Nigeria, you're 13 years yeah. old, yeah. Um, but your father dies yes. um, in Nigeria in a car crash. Yeah. Um, and there have been giant question marks put next to whether that was uh, an act of sabotage, political assassination, because he was looking into yeah. corruption. What, what, what was he looking <coughs> into? What do you think went on? Well, I don't know. I mean, we don't really talk about the exact circumstances. He did die in a car crash, but we don't really... There was a lot of speculation in Nigeria at the time around his death. He was a national political figure, and he was standing on an anti-corruption ticket, refused to bribe anybody. And there was a lot of speculation as to the circumstances of his death, which we don't really talk about, frankly, because it's not going to bring him back. Um, and that's the, that's the bottom line. It's not going to bring him back. And I'm not sure... I don't know. I mean, I think he would be bowled over that his son does what, he, what I do now. Um, and I think what he would have wanted is for me to strive to go on and, 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 and make a positive contribution and affect change, if possible, in the world. And I'm not sure he would have wanted me to dwell on the circumstances of his death. So that was always the approach that m m my family adopted in respect of that. But the the... My visits to Nigeria when I was a youngster had a huge impact on me because, um, and it's interesting actually how the context has changed because at that point, um, you, uh, it was at a time post Live Aid, comic relief, Save the Children, you, you often would see the images of that grinding poverty that you get in Africa. And when I went to Nigeria and started going frequently at that point, I saw that grinding poverty uh, children with bloated stomachs, w without much. Um, and that, certainly, at that young age, made me question, well, God, how is it that I've been lucky enough to be born in these circumstances, in this place, and not to go for want of food or clothes? And other people have been born into a completely different situation. And that just, to me, seemed wrong. I didn't understand that. I couldn't really compute that. Um, so that, I think that's had a big influence on my politics. Um, but one of the, just to draw a positive from it, in many respects, one of the really great things right now is if you actually look at what is happening in Africa, I mean, I think we've got to be very careful in terms of the way we look at what happens in the African continent, because it isn't what it was then. And, uh, you know, you look at the growth, 7.1% growth forecast by the IMF in Nigeria this year over 10% growth in Angola, over 5% growth in Ethiopia, over 5% growth in Mozambique. And then you look at UK under George Osborne, probably going to contract maybe this year, it's IMF forecasting 0.2% growth. So gone are the days when people like George Osborne can rock up to international fora and lecture the finance ministers from West African countries on what they need to do get, to get growth going again. Um, just going back to that uh, very formative moment when you lose your father, mm. what impact does it have on you personally? You're, you're a young boy. Um, does it shape your faith? Does it make you angry? What, what, what do you think you went through at that moment? It was, 
it was an incredibly difficult time for me and my family. And actually, I remember during the hustings for the selection um, in, in my constituency, in my CLP, and we, we all did our five minutes each. And the first question that we got um, in the Q&A after you'd done your speech, and there were like three or four questions, was what, what is your greatest achievement? And my answer to the question was, it's not my achievement. My sister and my mum were in the audience at this point. My mum, I think, was sobbing at this point. Because, um, and I, was, I just said, actually, I think the greatest achievement was that me, my mum, my sister actually managed to get through what was a really harrowing experience. And I think the way in which it affected me is that I, I think until later in life, maybe in your 20s, I think that's when you, you start to get a sense of mortality and that actually life is quite precious and it can be quite cheap. And so you've got to be really careful about it. And um, that sense of mortality uh, is something that I understood as soon as I had that experience. And it did make me grow up very quickly. And I do think I kind of leapfrogged a bit um, over some of those formative teenage years because of what I'd gone through and what my family had gone through. And it really it was just the three of us. And my mum had to deal with, you know, it wasn't just dealing with his affairs in the UK, it was also dealing with his affairs in Nigeria as well. And I just don't know how my mum got through it. But her answer always is, you know, um, it, we gained strength from each other. Um, but it was a very, very difficult experience. And, and, and in faith, did you have it? Did it, did it get snuffed out around that time? Well, I did, I, I did question my faith. I'm, I'm not a, a very religious person, but I was, um, I was a chorister at Southwark Cathedral in my youth. And um, I sang the theme tune to Mr. Bean, actually, with a lot of other <laughs> choristers. How, how, how does that go? I <laughs> <laughs> my voice broke a long time ago, Gary. You do not want me. You do not. Want, I, can't, <laughs> I can't even remember exactly. But um, uh, so I was, you know, I, I definitely think my Christianity has shaped my politics. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But my faith was shaken by that experience. And for a while, I, you know, perhaps I'd describe myself as quite agnostic. But um, uh, I don't think you can always explain things and, or explain why they happen. And you know, at the end of the day, my father thought he was going to live to 100 and it didn't happen. Um, and I don't have an, an explanation for that. I don't, you know, I think um, you can't explain everything in this world, but you can try and make it better. But in the sense that some people can be shoved off the rails, you kind of got on the rails um, through the loss of your father very fixedly. And you're, you do very well at uh, school. You're, you're into Manchester University reading law. Yeah. Um, and not particularly overly involved in uh, politics. You're not a student politic politician. No. On marches or anything like that? Or? No. Um, I don't mean that. It's not a bad thing to be on marches. But, um, have you ever been on a march? Uh, I have been on a march, yeah. Um, but no, I didn't really get involved in the whole student union politics. Partly because, frankly, and I'm probably going to offend a load of people in this room who were involved in student union politics, but I just didn't particularly feel that the kind of wannabe politician thing that tended to happen around student unions, I didn't feel that was very relevant to the majority of students. And... I, I think you have... And I'm probably being... Comp I'm, you know, I don't mean to be making these broad generalizations but I, I think you've got if you're going to do something like that make it relevant to the people that you purport to represent so I just didn't really it, it wasn't something that I wanted to get massively involved with but what I did get involved with was the university labor club so I was interested in growing that ensuring that we got more students getting involved and showing an interest in the labor party and I also got involved and would do campaigning and phone banking here in Manchester from Keith Bradley's office. Keith Bradley was the MP for Withington at the time and tried to get involved with campaigning out in the community. And that, that interested me far more. And I always remember actually, um, uh, my best mate in um, the PLP is um, Jonathan Reynolds. Johnny, Johnny and I used to run the, the Labour Club. And before us came Gary Follis, who is currently the Chief of Staff to Ed Balls. And I always remember Thanks Gary... Gary trying to get me to go to NUS conference, and uh, I wouldn't go. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't get me to go. But. Um, but, but this sort of focused on the rails um, young man then um, decides on a career in the law. 
Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not Citizens Advice Bureau stuff, is it? No, I mean, I've never, I'd, uh, you know, I <laughs> it's not, I, I mean, I never pretend that I went into the law because I wanted to become a, you know, a human rights lawyer and wanted to save people on death row and, and, and what have you. Um, I wanted actually to go, uh, my father had always planned actually, and I, I, I was happy to go along with this, that he and I would continue his business. And of course, I was robbed of that when we lost him. And I'd always been interested in going to business and finance in some way, shape or form. Um, and the skills that I had academically matched uh, the legal world. And so I thought, well, why don't I go and do law, but in a business and finance context? And I also wanted to do that as well, to be able to take advantage of having done you know, an inter a degree with, a, with an international element to it. So I, that's how I ended up going to work in the city, uh, because I wanted to work on international transactions. I wanted to work for different companies. It's takeovers and big city... I, yep, I worked on takeovers, acquisitions, mergers, and what have you. But I'd always... Uh, I, I thought I w was going... I, I, I went in thinking that I would probably want to become a corporate lawyer. But uh, part of... Although I'd enjoyed doing employment law a lot when I was here doing my degree at Manchester, but I thought I would have a problem practicing it because I mistakenly had this impression that somehow if you, d if you do employment law at a city firm, you're going to end up having to screw over employees, and that wasn't an attractive proposition to me. But actually, the reforms and the changes that we in government made to employment law meant the actual correct legal advice to your clients would be to do things the right way because of our Labour government. So your, your conscience not troubled by what you did. You felt you were doing you were doing okay, okay work, but in that environment. Well, the interesting thing is that's right. Now my conscience would be troubled well, in practice that. because okay. if you look at the changes that they have made, I was talking, talk, talking to a friend about this the other day. When I used to practice, and I stopped practicing in February 2010 before the election, the kind of advice I would have given then to an employee or an employer involved in a, a workplace dispute compared to now would be very different because of just how much they have weakened our unfair dismissal regime. And, and what about those, um, many of us won't have experience of the, mm. of the city, what about the characters of the people there? Could you, you know, smell what was going wrong? Could you, uh, did they seem like other rational human beings or were they <laughs> <laughs> dark forces? With Believe lives? it or not, there are quite a few Labour supporters in the city, they just don't <laughs> shout about it. Um, uh, uh, what did I find? I. I uh, I was attracted because it was exciting. I was, you know, in my early 20s working on international transactions. Occasionally, uh, you know, I went on to Common Tel ET for a short while um, to work on their refinancing. And um, I found a mixture of things. I found it, I, I enjoyed working for incredibly dynamic uh, companies and firms which were doing stuff that nobody had done before. And one thing that you do learn, actually, is the ones who are just simply out to make loads of money on the successful ones. The ones who, in a sense, they do want to be profitable, but actually they've got a mission for what they're doing and the product that they're producing, they're the ones who actually end up going on to be incredibly successful. So I, quite, I enjoyed working with people like that. Um, but there was a side to it, particularly, particularly when you were working on bulge bracket transactions, securitizations. Um, where I just, the, the figures that you were dealing with and the way in which the transactions you were working on seemed to just shift money around without actually necessarily creating an increase in output, uh, that I did question. I didn't totally understand, frankly. Now, at that stage, I thought, well, look, you're just a young lawyer. You've got a lot, a lot to learn, and, and you'll understand this a bit more later. But, of course, we saw the result of some of that, uh, of a lot of that, in the 2008-9 crash, where... Uh, certainly my view that, and I think John Kay, who Vince Cable commissioned to do a whole review into this, got it right, that the problem that we've got with the financial services sector is that increasingly it has come to serve financial intermediation and hasn't actually uh, performed the function either individuals deserve of it because it's a utility in many respects like getting your water or your electricity, but also what the real economy needs and businesses too. And uh, I cer certainly think my experience practicing informed it. And, and, and what I, I mean, uh, people might say, well, how, you know, how were you doing this when you're an employment lawyer? Because what happens if, if there's a takeover, a sale or acquisition of a company, 
you ask most business people what are your biggest assets mm. the people who work in the business so I would run the employment aspects of a transaction and I'd have to get to understand exactly what liabilities were being taken on or not um, so that was certainly what I was doing in in the city so I saw I saw things which I was uncomfortable with absolutely but I also did see a lot of dynamism and what makes British business great as well and, and the bit of your maybe CV that some people struggle with is how mm. the hotshot lawyer um, making bucks in the city um, ends up in not a great leap, quite a short period of time in Compass the Pressure Group yeah. and, and getting ready to stand for a, a, a Labour seat. Can you help them with that? Because uh, Compass's um, uh, diagnosis of what had gone wrong and particularly the relationship between the state and the market was absolutely something that I recognised and I agreed with. And of course, at that time, it was at a time where, I mean, this would have been the early noughties, where we were still very nervous about our history and being seen to be depicted as anti-business, anti-enterprise, etc. So we were fairly hands-off, particularly with the structure of the economy. Now, I think the really welcome thing is that there's been a sea change. And if you say talk to Peter Mandelson and ask him what his approach was to the business department and then the DTI in 98 and what it was when he returned in 2008, he will openly say to you that my kind of conception was very different because I had seen during his time at the Trade Commission, uh, sorry, the Trade at the European Commission, how actually there is a role for an active government to play working with the market. And there are certain things that the market left to its own devices will not deliver. Things don't just happen automatically. And that, that, that was something, that was a, a belief that those in and around Compass had at a very early stage. And I identified with that. Now, how I ended up uh, standing for Parliament, I didn't expect to be doing... Look, if you'd asked me th four years ago, do you think you'd be a member of Parliament, let alone a business sector, I'd fall off my chair. Um, I, I didn't expect to be doing what I am doing now. But I think what I found so frustrating both in the, the working at Herbert Smith in the city, which is a fantastic firm, and I look back with great affection to my time there, but also to the smaller firm I went to afterwards, was that ultimately you were advising people on laws that you had had not any say in kind of shaping or making, and you weren't really calling the shots. And ultimately, you weren't really transforming the world in a big way. So you could deliver a result for your, your client, a company, um, but or, or an individual, but it wasn't going to affect big change. And I think ultimately, although politics as an occupation has been uh, knocked massively in the wake of expenses and the re and what have you, uh, and yes, the world of finance in the city is is powerful and influential. The world of the media is as well. I think ultimately, politics is still that primary vehicle to affect big change on a lot of people. And you know, you look in London when we had. Uh, fellow Londoners being blown up on buses and on the tube. The people looked to the media or the city or these other centres of influence to resolve those issues and ensure the people's voices heard and affected change. No, they looked to politics. And that was ultimately what made me think and why I was impatient to get involved with the, you know, more deeply involved with the Labour Party there, than I was any, at that time. Are there any particular people or is there a moment when that, uh, the, the people that urge you on or a moment when the light... Well, I, I, I'd always, uh, I, I tell you when uh, I'd been travelling and uh, after I'd finished my training as a solicitor and I remember getting back to the, the, the office in uh, the city and I'd qualified and I've literally back a week and I thought, oh my God, is this what I'm going to be doing for the next 10 to 15 years? Which was kind of crazy because I spent so long and worked so hard to get to that point. Um, but I'm just impatient. I mean, this is, I, am, I cannot tell you how hungry I am for us to win the next general election. We do not want to be in the shadows. I am fed up being in the shadows. <laughs> yeah. because, because ultimately, if we get in that way, you can affect massive change. And I always remember during the general election, and I think we underplayed what we actually delivered in our communities. Because the, the, the conversation, I don't know if you all had this experience, but I, I most liked having on the doorstep with my neighbours, my friends, my constituents, was when they say, oh, you lot, you haven't done anything. What's Labour done here? And I said, um, do you like your safer neighbourhood tea? Uh, 
do you, what school does your child go to? And you could just go through the list of things we're doing, whether it's setting up safer neighbourhood teams in every ward, whether it was the six new or improved health centres in the constituency, whether it was the building schools for the future project, m whether it was the tax credits that people were taking advantage of. And once you got to the end of this, I go, oh yeah, all right. I remember actually having one conversation with a lady who actually worked at a Shore Start Centre who said this to me. And I said, where do you work? And she said, I work at F for Shore Start. I said, but you wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for the Labour Party setting up your Shore Start Centre. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and this is maybe where, where we have come a cropper because we haven't connected enough politics and what we're doing with people's lives. And that's where, why whenever I try, you know, whenever I, I do media on behalf of the party nationally, I'm always thinking, how can I connect what I'm saying to the person who is sitting in the armchair in the lounge watching this? How can I make this real for them? Because I think one of our problems sometimes is, is that there is a tendency to talk in you know, jargon and billions and percentages. You've got to relate it to people's lives to make it real and relevant. Mm. Uh, when, when we were chatting just the other day, you mentioned that you, you come into Parliament your very first day, or it might have been your ma I think it might have been your maiden speech or the first day you come in and swear the... Uh, oath or whatever, yeah. and uh, two people or one person comes up to you and there's someone at his shoulder as well. Can you, you um, uh, the Prime Minister David Cameron? Oh, um, that was actually, no, that, <laughs> that was um, on my way out of the chamber just after I'd been um, uh, promoted to, to, to become Shadow Business Secretary. And on my way out, the Prime Minister said to me, he said, oh, he said, um, that was quite something to, you know, very early. Uh, very early to be appointed that kind of moment. I said, yes, sir, no, it's a big responsibility. And kind of like rabbit caught a head headlamps at this point. And um, behind us is Ken Clark. goes, oh, the knives will be out for you now. The knives will be out. Got to watch your back. I said, oh, thanks for that, Ken. <laughs> it ended up on Ice by MP somehow afterwards. Like, God knows who heard the conversation. But you do, you do, you know, you do have these... Um, I was talking to Tessa Jowell. Tessa Jowell is my political mum, by the way. Even my mum calls her my political mum. Um, and um, one thing that Tessa said to me, and sh you know, she's my, na my neighbouring MP um, amongst many, and, uh, and I'm obviously just, we're really sad to have lost Malcolm, of course, who's another one of m my neighbouring MPs. But Tessa said um, to me that even to this day when she goes into the House of Commons, she pinches herself because she's a member of parliament. And it, I can tell you, she's absolutely right, it just, it does not leave you, That's, that sense of privilege to do what you do. And, you know, the opportunity that you all give us to serve is, it's, n it's never anything you forget. I, 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 I just think it's such a sacred thing. You, you must have come across jealousy, the reports of how you were supposed to have a bigger entourage than... President Obama. Um, <laughs> all, all this. How many people are in your team? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was so bemused by this, and maybe uh, I just don't know. Um, I have. Uh, I don't. Frankly, we don't have enough people. I think <laughs> we don't. <laughs> well, I, I don't think we do have enough people. Uh, capa be? Capacity issues are major, and and mm. my the people who work for me, um, as far as I'm concerned, they're underpaid. They work 24-7, seven days a week uh, for the Labour Party. And because they are deemed to be an expense, they're not paid what they deserve for serving my community and serving us nationally as a party. I think it's outrageous. And, and I think if you ask any member of the Shadow Cabinet, any front venture, whether our people get paid enough, they'll say no. You're ashamed and of whether the rates that are... I am ashamed yeah. of what we pay the people who work for us. Um, and also we could really do with more people because the scale of what, look, um, on my brief, I cover, it's the biggest brief in the shadow cabinet, it's the biggest brief in government, it has more uh, ministers in the department than any other, and you know, we've got the whole business agenda and all the different sectors, higher education, further education, the Royal Mail, the post office, international trade, employment, industrial relations, it's huge. And for, I have, you know, aside from my constituency office, to have three people working on that entire thing, servicing a team of myself included 10 shadow ministers is impossible. And in many respects, I mean, the, the Tories had much more resource than us in the lead up to this general election. How they did not win, given the, the resource they had, 
um, is extraordinary. So, um, you, know, I, you know, these entourage stuff, whatever, it's just, you, you get this stuff in the media, you, don't you? You said um, politics is politics a second ago, but it's, it's also, there's an old saying, isn't it, uh, politics is show business for ugly people. Um, and, um, Where are you going with this, Gary? <laughs> there seems to be a broad consensus forming amongst women journalists who've interviewed you that you don't fall into that category. Um, and I'm wondering if... It, if what am I supposed to say to this? There's no, there, there's no right answer to this one. Is it, a, is it a tricky thing to cope with? Does it inspire some jealousy? <laughs> um, you're a good-looking bloke. And it's politics. It's, it's, you've broken the boundaries there a bit. I, look, I don't think the way that I look will make any difference to the people that I represent or who this party aspires to govern for in the future. It's what we say and what we do that matters. And there is a suggestion that voters find it easier to vote for good-looking people. And, and for those, for those, for those, what are you saying, Gary? What are you saying about the people who voted but for you, me in Stratford? You get these uh, infuriating, no doubt, from your point of view, headlines. That this was the Mail on Sunday. I'm helping you with it again. You don't have to buy it. Now. Yeah. Uh, the headline. Uh, it's not a Bible, you know. The British Obama? Question <laughs> mark. Um, I didn't speak to them. You did. <laughs> um, Fair point. Okay, I'll, ta I'll take says, that one. Um, I'll take that one. You don't no with the devil occasion. The Black Blair or British Obama. Um, presumably you're not really happy with either of those. Well, as, no, as I always say, uh, I, I'm quite happy being Stratton's Chukka Romana. That's good enough for me. Um, now, you're, as you say, uh, got this busy uh, portfolio in the, in, in the shadow cabinet. Uh, do you see yourself perhaps as the voice for business in the Labour Party, in the shadow cabinet, when not everyone else is necessarily listening to those voices? Well, I actually think that we all have to be a voice for business in many respects. Um, look, let's be, be absolutely frank about it. Um, there is obviously huge disagreement between ourselves and the Tories. I mean, just count the Lib Dems as being part of the same crew. Um, you know, there is uh, a huge amount of difference in terms of what we do vis-a-vis -vis deficit reduction. But where there is a consensus is that primarily, although I absolutely believe that the state has a role in this, growth to, to the extent it comes in the future, has got to be private sector driven. Now, you can't just have that being uh, a concern of the shadow business team. It has to be a concern of all of the teams. So Jim, for example, in defence, isn't just looking at our strategic defence capacity and capability. He's also thinking about our defence industry. Maria thinks the same way vis-a-vis -vis transport. How do we actually ensure that we have a, not just an infrastructure that will serve uh, both the public and private sector, but that we have leading you know, a, a, a aviation companies. We've got Airbus based, I visited the Airbus. So it's a concern of everybody because of what the, the task that we're asking business and the private sector to do. Um, you, you were talking about what have, one of the people you've been talking to about all of this and what, what, how business partners should be uh, run is Peter Mandelson. Yeah. Um, Tell me a bit about those conversations, and um, is he seeing you as a little bit of a protege? Do you see? <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, he did say to me once. I think people may have heard of me say this before. I, I bumped into Peter. I hadn't actually. He was meeting somebody else, and he said to me, "He said, Chuka, do not squander your legacy." Yeah. And um, <laughs> I said, "Don't worry." Um, but the, the point is, seriously, what I think Peter got right towards the end of our time in government, and frankly we got this right too late during our time in government, is the desire and the determination to prosecute a proper active industrial strategy. And that isn't something that he will freely admit that he did in his first time, you know, his first stint in the DTI, but certainly we needed to do in our second. So, I, I mean, leave aside of this protege stuff, I really want to take that approach and grow it and expand it and develop it because it's absolutely crucial. If we are serious about uh, tackling the big domestic challenges that we have, the cost of living crisis that people are facing, the fact that we need to diversify the sectors that we rely on to deliver growth, the fact that we need an economy more balanced between our regions and one that is uh, set up to meet UK PLC's international challenge competing with Brazil, India, China, all these other countries. We have to have government working strategically with business to do that.
to identify the sectors, I mentioned aerospace, food and drink is one of them, life sciences, where we have a competitive edge and comparative advantage globally, but also we need to think about, well, what are going to be the growth sectors of the future? That, you know, in these emerging market economies, we're going to see a global middle class balloon from 1.8 billion to 5 billion. I want to ensure that our British businesses in all the regions of this country are set up to meet that demand. And that way, not only we can get more jobs, and we've got over two and a half million people still out of work in this country, but better quality and better paid jobs too. So you're, what you're doing is you're reconfiguring the economy that way so it delivers more jobs, better quality jobs in the first instance. So we don't need to do as much redistribution through tax credits and what have you afterwards. That's the thing, structurally reconfiguring and building a new economy. Uh, which, which we're going to hear more about this week. But just, yeah. just before I completely leave Peter, Peter Mandelson alone, um, he, uh, did, did he organise an audience with uh, Tony Blair for you as well? And no, I'm, no. <laughs> oh, where did these papers get these things from? No, no, no. I, 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 you've, anyway, you've had a chat with him, or, or more than one chat. Uh, what, what do you make of him? What, what, how would you assess Tony Blair's legacy? Do you think you're... I did, look, I disagreed with um, Tony on the Iraq war, like many members of our party, and I was slightly uncomfortable with the degree of choice and contestability advocated in our public services. But equally, he achieved a huge amount, N not just winning three general elections, but if people think we would have done the redistribution that we did, we redistributed more money from rich to poor than any government since the war. That happened under Tony Blair's watch. Um. <laughs> the, uh, you mentioned choice and contestability. If, yeah. if, if Progress, the group you're going to talk to tonight, um, stands for anything, uh, it, it, it's been about that, hasn't it? Uh, bringing the private sector into the uh, public sector to try and get, as they would argue, best value for the taxpayer out of the whole thing. And what people struggle with, I think, is mm. that there you were in Compass, sure. and there you were also, we haven't touched on this, being one of the early supporters of uh, Ed Miliband. Yeah who worries about all this stuff, and there you are tonight, as you have been on past occasions, hmm. and will be no doubt on future occasions, going to the heart of the sort of hmm. Blairite project and speaking to but them that waving their flag. Which, well, which there's two, you, th th there's, there's, two, there's two things about that, but th this is a kind of divide and rule, which we are not going to allow to happen in this Labour Party, because we've all got to work together to make sure that we get Ed Miliband as our Prime Minister in 2015, bottom line. But uh, there is, of course, already private sector involvement in the public services. The question is of degree. And to suggest that everybody who's a member of Progress has one view of that is wrong, because not everybody has the same view in, in that respect. Uh, where, where are you? Well, I think you've got to draw, draw the line somewhere. Now, if you're going to ask me to go and draw it now in each policy area, I'm not going to do that for you, because that wouldn't be sensible. But um, where I do think Progress absolutely have been right over the years is in the unapologetic pro-business stance. I think you have, if you know, we have got to be a party that is pro-business and enterprise. I think where I think everybody's been on a journey in this respect, uh, Progress included, is that the problem, and this goes to the heart of Ed's speech last year, is that if you look historically, the mid-90s we were seeking to show that we hadn't just reached an accommodation with the market, with business, with enterprise, but that we positively embraced all of those things. The problem was we embraced it whole and we weren't discerning enough about the kind of business practices, models and behaviours that we wanted to see. And that is our job going forward. And you know that is very much the thinking of most people in Progress Compass, wherever, I think everybody recognises that. That's why we've been talking about the need for a better and more responsible capitalism, because there are varieties of capitalism and they have different outcomes. And we have to make a choice about the kind of outcome that we want. Again, I think people, some, some people who were with you in Compass yeah. struggle a bit with where, where you are now. Has there been a political journey for you? Nothing wrong with the political journey. Or are you saying that your views haven't changed really one jot since those... No, I think that would be, be disingenuous to say that I haven't been on the journey as I've learnt more. I think you're always um, developing as a politician, but I, I think actually all of us have been on a journey, and I think people in Compass and Progress have been on a journey, and frankly, I don't believe that most members of the Labour Party see what we do and the arguments within it through a Compass Progress prism anymore, and I think that's a great thing. There's one trade union trying to get Progress thrown out of the... 
you know, this would be a train out of the Labour Party. Uh, but I don't, I don't think we should be looking to throw out or exclude anybody from the Labour Party. We're a broad church. We've got to build a broad coalition to ensure that we get a Labour government elected and we win back the support of the British people. And I don't see how excluding anybody from that endeavour is particularly helpful. And there's no sense in which, uh, you mentioned Harold Wilson a while ago and how he was yeah. quite an inspiration to your father. Um, Harold Wilson uh, was someone who people on the left thought had maybe used Tribune a bit on his way up and had, had always consciously had a journey in mind uh, in order to get to where he wanted to get to power. Um, and that, no parallels? I don't think so. And also what a lot of people um, ignore is that Compass has been framing much of the debate this year. The High Pay Commission was set up by Compass. It is the authority on issues around remuneration in the boardroom in the city right now. It's generally recognised to be independent as well. Um, and that is something that, you know, I've, I've worked, uh, we have backed all the recommendations of the High Pay Commission. So I don't really get this, this I, I can see th the point you're making is you're on a journey, you're moving from compass to progress. I just don't see it like that. Because I, 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 think all, I think all parts of our Labour Party have something to offer. And I don't think um, uh, either compass, compass or Progress have any exclusive purchase on all the best ideas. Um, I think everybody's got something to contribute. It's one of the reasons why I don't think it's helpful to say we should be excluding anybody from the project that we're on. Just tell me a bit about the, the Edmund Miliband you first meet years ago. And what makes you decide that he's um, the kind of guy to do it? And I, I'm particularly interested about stuff that you would have um, seen of him earlier yeah. on, rather than the figure we see having to sit through a Maher interview and the rest of it now. I thought he was great this morning. Who saw that? Yeah. He was brilliant. That was an easy one. <laughs> it's true. Um, it was but great. What, but what, what did you see then? What was he, what was he like way back then? Because a lot of people didn't think he'd necessarily want to be front of shop. They thought he was a backroom he, boy uh, back then. I, I, I met Ed in 2006-07. And, I mean, first of all, the... I don't know if it's not news to anybody, Ed is a, a lovely guy. He's a very approachable person. And, you know, compared to some other people you come across in politics, he's pretty ego-free. Um, but that wasn't why I backed him, actually. And I backed him early. And I backed him early because I was convinced that Ed would lead change and uh, do a thorough-based questioning of how we had sought to apply social democratic values uh, at the point that the leadership election took place, how we had applied those values over the few years leading up to that election, and that he would be prepared to question things that we'd come to regard as accepted wisdom in a way that I didn't think the other candidates would do, frankly. And that is ultimately why I backed him, in addition to him essentially sitting in the same political space as me. But I knew that we needed to change and that the voters had sent us a very clear message and we needed to respond to that. And, it's, you know, it's accepted wisdom now that we talk about how we change and what we need to revise and, we, you know, we've, we've done a bit of mea culpa or kind of um, exploration of the position we adopt in relation to immigration, for example, with... Look, I've just talked about the kind of stance we adopted to capitalism and business. And I just knew he was going to do this. And now everybody accepts and takes it for granted now, but I'm not sure everybody would have done that. And that was essentially why I backed Ed. And would you ever rule out going for that job yourself one day? You well, I just think, I, I, feel, I feel so uncomfortable with those questions. And i tell you why. Because it would be... I hear someone laughing behind me. <laughs> it's Michael Craig. Oh, it's Michael Craig. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, but... <laughs> He's always there, he's always somewhere. But um, i tell you why, because I think it would be incredibly... Uh, I, I, I just I think there's something very unhealthy about presupposing that you alone would be the best person to make very big decisions involving life and death decisions for some people in this country at some point in the future. It would be incredibly arrogant for me or anyone else to say, in two or three years, I'd be the best person to lead this country. I, 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 I feel deeply uncomfortable about that. Do you ever think of going back to being a DJ? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I love what I do too much right now. I mean, it's, I never, I think one of the reasons we're so lucky to be members of parliament is I never wake up in the morning and think, oh God, I've got to go to work today. 
you just don't look at it like that. Um, I don't see what I do as work. It's a mission, basically. And if you don't see it that way, you shouldn't be doing it. And it's just such a privilege to do it and to serve. And I'm not just saying that. I, I absolutely mean that. So I, I get up in the morning. I want to go to do what we do as members of parliament. And I, I see it as kind of a, a vocation, really, in many respects. It's just such a, such a privilege. So I won't be DJing for a long time yet. Um, I think that's what uh, Boris Johnson calls a tear-shuddering climax. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not apt to, to quote Boris very often. Uh, and on your behalf, I'd like to thank Chucker for sharing his thoughts with us uh, this lunchtime. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.